ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's fabulous to be here. On behalf of the UK Resuscitation Council, I've got to offer massive congratulations. These two words, CFR Ireland, I don't know anywhere else in the world that has a national community responder scheme. And for you guys all to be in one place today, don't underestimate how awesome that is. And it's a huge privilege uh, for me to be here and, and talk to you today. I flew across last night. Did you know that British Airways have started making you charge for food and drink? Yeah. Ryanair has got so much to answer for. I was so disappointed. Because the last time I flew British Airways, I was sitting, having had my fifth bottle of wine, because it was free. <laughs> Is there a doctor on board? Can he please make himself known immediately? <laughs> I've, I've had five bottles of wine, I better not. If there's a doctor on board, and she sounded pretty panicky, actually. So I thought, you know what, I better go up. So I got up my seat, went up, and there was an 80-year-old man lying across the galley in cardiac arrest. I was like, oh, that's not good. And all credit to British Airways, they've got all the kit you could ever imagine. And we worked on him for a while. And actually, his wife came up to me, and she tapped me on the shoulder, and she said, Doc, it's OK. He's got cancer. We were going to see family. I'd just like you to stop. And I thought, you know what? That sounds like a really good idea. And actually, this wasn't a cardiac arrest. This was death. This was the end of his life, and we needed to treat that with respect. So I walked back to my seat, having had all this commotion, and the same stewardess picked up the PA on a 747 and went, if there's a priest on board, can he please make himself known? <laughs> I was like, oh, no. So I, I kind of trudged back to my seat, and I was, oh, this is really bad, you know, this is really bad. And we've talked this morning about luck, haven't we? You know, clearly that was, was that unlucky, we've heard some tragic stories, some amazing stories. What is luck, okay? What, why, what is it? Is it, are we really lucky when people survive? Now when we think about the airline industry, in the UK, it's not when we're going to have, sorry, it's not if we're going to have a terrorist attack. It's when, and the government have invested huge amounts in, in stuff like this. When the police arrive, they will be armed. They may be dressed differently depending on their function. Their first task will be to deal with the immediate threat to prevent further casualties. This may take a long time. I'm showing you this because you guys need to know about the arousal curve and how you perform when you're under pressure, just like these armed police do, okay? So if you look at this, too little stress, we're pretty chilled, pretty inactive, and as the stress wraps up, we become more and more excitable, but we can go over the edge. And I'm gonna talk about this red zone. Now, I know you guys like red, <laughs> and it's a red army, but actually, you really don't want to go into this red zone, okay, where you're overcome with excitement when your phone goes off. In the heat of the moment, you're not going to be perform optimally, okay? Now, I've done a bit of work with these guys, our, our anti-terrorism guys. Now, this guy, just like you, gets one chance to get it right, okay? When he storms that building and he takes the shot, He's got to take out the terrorist. If he misses, the terrorist is going to blow something up. If he misses, he might shoot you. You guys get one shot to get this right when your pager gets off, goes off. If you aren't performing optimally, if you're in the red zone, I'm going to show you that actually care can be really badly compromised. So when I speak to these guys, I say, you know what, is there such thing as luck when you go and blow up a building? And they say, yeah, sure. And you know what their formula is for luck? They have a formula. Luck is a combination of training and experience. And the more you train and the more experienced you are, the luckier you'll be. And I think that's true. 
So let's apply luck to some real-life cardiac arrest cases. Everything I'm going to talk to you about is true. Let's use this guy. This guy's called Clive. He's 49. He's a very successful lawyer, very similar to a couple of the patients. He does a lot of sport. He's super fit. He goes to the gym one day, and he feels a bit unwell, and he collapses in the gym. He goes into VF. He's in cardiac arrest. The gym instructor heard the thud. He runs upstairs. He calls for help. We'll come back to Clive a bit later. Now, how you perform when you try and resuscitate someone like Clive is directly related to your training. You don't suddenly get better when Clive arrests. You don't rise to the occasion and nail it. You will fall to the level of your training. Under pressure, you fall to the level of your training. So if you're an F-16 pilot, you train to 120% of your ability so that when you're being shot at, you will fall to a safe level. So you guys need to overtrain. And there's good evidence that even after two or three months, CPR training fades off, and you need to be all over it. And there's good examples of this. The best example I could think of, remember the Hudson River crash? Yeah? So what did Captain Sullenberger, he had precisely 63 seconds in that arousal curve to make some big decisions, didn't he, about what he was going to do with his plane. And he said he'd never shut down a single engine in 42 years. Your pager might have never gone off. You might never have seen someone in cardiac arrest. But I was ready. He was ready. He was ready for that day. He would need to make that split session life-saving decision. And you guys need to be ready. You need to have that psychology of always being prepared, of always knowing you're going to be at your best. So luck, training, and experience. Top tip number one, keep calm and just don't mess it up. <laughs> OK, so a little bit about me. I've wanted to be a doctor for a long time, like a really long time, since I was like six, all right? I've been to a lot of cardiac arrest. I stopped counting at 300 or something. And what I'm going to share with you is some of my experience and the science of what makes someone like Clive going to live or die and show you it's nothing to do with luck in the traditional sense. Does anyone know who this guy is? No? You've got to Google him. He's the godfather of resuscitation, Peter Safar. Unbelievable guy who coined the name resuscitationists. You are all resuscitationists. You are passionate about this field, all right? And you should all become resuscitationists. You are resuscitationists. And Peter described that death process very eloquently. And he said, death is a pathophysiological process, not one moment in time. What that means is death suddenly just doesn't just happen Death is like a window of opportunity. Your patient is crying out to survive, like the video we saw right at the beginning. That patient has a few minutes where you guys have to intervene. You need to maximize that window. And of course, the window is all about the chain of survival. And you've seen the chain of survival. I love this picture. Okay, Why do I love this picture? Because the chain of survival relies on the baton being transferred from the 991, 999, 911, whatever you use, system, to the CFR, to the ambulance, to the ED, to the ICU. If you're the British, the British Olympic team, you're fucked. Why? Because we drop the baton every single time. <laughs> all right? Every time. You need the Jamaican relay team <laughs> to resuscitate you. And you need to think about it. Now, the chain of survival is not the same, and it is not linear. What do I mean by that? I mean that the first two rungs are way more important than anything else. What you do is way more important than what we do in the hospital with all the clever stuff with cooling and anesthetics. Why? Because if you don't get the CPR right, if the shocks don't go in in time, 
we don't have anything to work with, okay? If Clive doesn't get shocked, if he doesn't get good CPR, he's gonna be brain dead by the time he gets to hospital. You are the most important links in the chain of survival, and you need to remember that. And you can sum up CPR really easily, right? If Clive gets CPR, his chance of survival is about one in five. If no one does CPR on Clive, his chances of survival are about one in 20. Okay, very straightforward. Now, why is that? You need to know, as resuscitationists, a little bit about what happens to the heart in cardiac arrest. I'm gonna show you a video of a heart in VF, okay? I want you to watch carefully. This heart is in VF, it's flickering away. He's pointing to the left ventricle and the right ventricle. This is within one minute of no CPR being performed. Okay, what can you see? The heart on the right is big, it's engorged. You can just look at that and know it's never gonna beat. You can shock it till you're blue in the face. It's never gonna beat because the CPR hasn't been performed well enough. And how you perform your CPR can make the difference between life and death for someone like Clive. This graph shows the chances of you sh your shock working depending on how deep you've pushed, okay? So, nice little ding, less than 26 mil, you've only got 50% of shocks are gonna work. Why? Because the heart has been allowed to get into that big blobby state that I showed you. Push properly over five centimeters, you're up to the 100% mark, okay? So, doing the basics brilliantly is a key part of being a resuscitationist. You need to do the basics perfectly every time. And if we extrapolate this, I was fascinated to see that registry um, graph of how bystander CPR is coming up. That's awesome. This is from Denmark. Now, it's a really busy slide, but you guys, as a national program, are really well placed to do this, especially with things like CPR in schools. This is what they did in Denmark. This was their survival from cardiac arrest, three and a half percent. Their bystander CPR rate steadily climbed, so did their survival rate. How did they do it? Training everyone in the schools, making it mandatory to pass a CPR exam for your driving test, sending CPR kits to homes, really big impact. And please, please don't forget the dispatch center, okay? The calls come in and we forget that the people on the end of the phone have to listen to stuff like this. Sounds ready? My, my, my brother and my mum are doing CPR, 1962. Are you with him at the moment? We are, my mum and my, mom and my 19 year old brother are, are um, them. Tell you exactly what to do. Right, okay. Now, is he sat on his back? He's like, we've just moved him on. This is a 12-year-old child who's witnessed her father arrest and her mother is doing CPR on her dad, all right? This is hugely stressful. And how this call handler acts is going to have a big impact on survival. If the call handler correctly recognizes cardiac arrest, and that is hard on the end of the phone. Is it a seizure? Is it collapse? If they get it right, and say, do CPR at about 43% survival rate. If they miss it and they think, nah, he's just collapsed, he's just fainted, big difference in survival, 12% lower, okay? So when you go to your calls, ring up the dispatcher and say, well done, you persuaded that person to do CPR. Good job, I know it was stressful, we've got their heart started again, nice one, okay? Because they get forgotten about. Defibrillation is really, really important. Why? Very simple. For every minute that goes by in a patient like Clive, who's lying on the floor of the gym in VF, survival is going down by 10%. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? You need to get there very quickly. Now, this is fascinating. This is UK data and shows the impact you guys can have. Okay, average for the UK is about a 7% survival rate from cardiac arrest. If no one does anything, it's about five. If you just do CPR and wait for the ambulance service to arrive, 
about 9%. If you get a CPR, if you do CPR and have an AD on fast, as part of a CFR scheme, for example, look at that massive improvement in survival. And if you get there within three or five minutes, three quarters of your patients like Clive can survive. This is why the front of the chain of survival and you are so, so important. And to do this AED within five minutes, we've got to get clever. We've got to use technology. We have to use apps. We have to use locator systems. We have to know where these devices are so we can respond quickly, just as we heard about with those, that time talk and how seconds are important. Now, I've got a pretty cool job. I get to wear a funky red suit, although people say I look like a subway worker sometimes. <laughs> I get to fly around places like London and land in Trafalgar Square, and it's all really sexy. But I remember the first time I went into that red zone, that red zone of being totally overwhelmed that I was not performing very well. And that was for a case with a little boy called Kai. And Kai was a fit and healthy two-year-old boy, and he was running across his playroom, and he just dropped. He was in cardiac arrest. Even weirder than that, Kai was in a VF cardiac arrest. And kids don't generally go into VF, do they? It was the week before Christmas. His presents were wrapped up in the cupboard, his mum picked him up off the floor and started doing CPR on her own two-year-old child on her kitchen table. Now, we arrived in the helicopter, and I was like, oh, my God, this is full on. And we were having to put needles in, and I had never anesthetized a child on my own in my life. Now, giving a two-year-old an anesthetic on his kitchen table in front of his parents definitely put me into that red zone. But it worked. We anesthetized him, we got a ROSC, he's very unstable, his heart kept stopping, he's very difficult to maintain his blood pressure. So how did I do it? How did I cope with being in the red zone? The answer is that you never work alone. You always work in a team. A team like this, okay? These guys can change a Formula One tire in what is it, like 5.8 seconds or something, okay? If you work in a team, you need to train as a team. These guys train and train and train until they can nail it. If you work in a team, you have to train as a team. This is a response to cardiac arrest in Norway. CFR doing CPR, doctor there, the ambulance there. So I urge you, go out in your local community, which are all very different, okay, and train with the paramedics. Train with each other. Train with the people you're going to be working with. Because there's nothing more effective than rocking up to someone like Kai or Clive when you know everyone. You know yourself, don't you? Hey, guys, how's it going? This is what we've got. Pff, get stuck in. So think about that. Be a resuscitationist, OK? Be a champion for resuscitation. Know the science. Think about nailing those basics and practicing those basics and practicing them as a team together. Point number two. Now, if we think about sport again, one thing Britain is really good at, we're not very good at relays and buttons, we suck at that. We're quite good at cycling, aren't we? We always seem to nail the cycling. Team GB nail the cycling. And why do they nail the cycling? Any idea? They've got this thing called aggregation of marginal gains. What does that mean? Well, their sports psychologist looked at every single thing they did, what pillow they slept on, what they ate for breakfast, whether their girlfriend was allowed to stay over so they weren't a horny, stressed mess on the day of the race. All right? <laughs> Everything was evaluated. And each little thing might have contributed half a percent, point one of percent, but when you added it all together, it added up to half a second, one second, which is the advantages they need. And you need to think about this. We just had that awesome talk where is the AED? Is your car parked in the right direction? Are the keys ready? Is the kit ready to go? All these little things are crucially important, and you need to work with your dispatch center to see if you can shave off those valuable seconds. 
Because even if it's two or three seconds there, that adds up to a minute or two. That's 20, 30% worth of survival for patients like Clive, for patients like Kai. So top tip number three, don't leave it to luck. Prepare aggregation of marginal gains. Look for the little improvements you can make. So let's get back to wrapping up our stories. Clive lying on the floor of the gym. Clive was my dad. This is a picture of us on our regular family holidays to the Swiss Alps. Dad was super fit. He cycled 120 miles the day before he collapsed. I was with him in the gym. I saw him collapse. For Dad, luck kind of wasn't on his side. Yeah, I recognized it was cardiac arrest. It was a big problem in the dispatch center. They didn't really want to believe me and were trying to tell me it was a seizure and it's a bit annoying. I was the only person in the gym that was trained in CPR. And after a few minutes, it got pretty tiring and I've no doubt my performance fell apart after you know three, four, five minutes. There was certainly no AED in the gym. It was 14 minutes before the ambulance arrived with a defibrillator. And there was certainly nothing clever like you know ECMO and all these things we have these days. Dad's luck had totally run out and he died on the floor of the gym when he was 49 years old. And I show you that because it really can happen to anyone. We've heard the story you know, of young people it really can happen to anyone. And you need to approach this as if it was any of your family. That's how important you guys are in making a difference. It's not a patient. It's someone's dad. It's someone's son. It's Kai. It's a little kid. It's someone's husband or wife. Now, on the afternoon of flying to Kai, having anesthetized him, and I was sort of pretty full-on job, got another job. And I definitely think there's such thing as bad luck. There is definitely such thing as bad luck. So Mark, who's a young guy, took his granny out for a walk in a park in London. And there are these, we call them Neds in Scotland. They're sort of, you know, the yobs, unsavory characters. We're chucking conkers at Mark and his granny. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was out with his granny, for goodness sake. He said, guys, come on, give it a break. My granny's 80, leave her alone. Chucking conkers at her. Oh, who do you think you are? Don't talk to us like that. <laughs> Pulled out a knife, plunged the knife straight into Mark's chest. I mean, that is, that is just bad luck. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong people. And we got there, and Mark was in cardiac arrest. He was in cardiac arrest with a, with a hole through his heart, all right? Now, one of the things we can do on the helicopter now, okay, is literally open you up on the side of the road. This is not one for going on the live tube feed, please. We can open them up and literally stitch, stitch Mark's heart back together. Now, lucky? Absolutely not. This is training and this is experience. We drilled this, I'd never done it before, but by God I was ready. I was ready to have to do this procedure, and I'd trained for it, and I'd visualized it, and I'd rehearsed it in my head, just as Captain Sullenberger had done, for just that eventuality, he was have to gonna do something full on. And 24 hours later, Mark was <laughs> all right. And he's, yeah, he's got a bit of marker across his chest, but he'll be fine. <laughs> so I show you that because if, if, I'd have, if someone had said to me, Richard, you know, 10 years ago, you're going to cut this guy open and stitch his heart, I'd be like, impossible. No way. It's not going to happen. And you've got to dare to dream big in this game. Someone told me last night one of the CFR schemes is wanting its own helicopter. How cool is that? <laughs> and I go for it. Absolutely go for it. Yeah. There's that whole big corner of Ireland that has no freaking red dots in, you know. Brilliant, put a helicopter in. If someone's gonna give you the money, go for it. Don't think you can't do it because it's not possible, okay?
dare to dream big because it is worth it. Now, when I say it is worth it, the best day of my whole life, don't tell my wife I said this because it wasn't my wedding day, <laughs> the best day of my whole life was this day, going to Great Ormond Street and seeing Kai. <laughs> And he gave me this big smile, and he's absolutely fine. And he sends me messages on Facebook, and it's awesome. And I learned something about Ikigai. I had never heard of Ikigai. Ikigai is a Japanese word for the sense of value. What, what makes us get out of bed in the morning? What drives you to do what you do? And it's a kind of combination of lots of stuff. It's stuff that you're passionate about, it's stuff that we need to do because the worlds need it, and I'm super lucky. If you can get paid for it, even better. And in your job, you're probably doing the bottom bit in your day job. You get paid for it, and often that's about it. Being a community first responder gives you all of this, okay? You've heard from your colleagues. When you first get that save, when someone comes and says, Thank you, I'm doing great. It is a really, really good feeling. And it will make you want to do more of it, and it is, there is no job in the whole world that could pay me enough for that one moment of going to see Mark or going to see Kai in the hospital. And you guys in Ireland have a massive opportunity. I am so impressed and so jealous of what you guys are doing, because the planets are really aligning itself. Nowhere has a national CFR program. You've got an ambulance service that is supporting you. You've got an emergency care council that is supporting you. You guys are destined for great things, and as one country, you can do great things because it's very easily to do, unlike England, who are lagging behind in some of these domains. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying thank you Thank you for all the stuff you do and the survivors that you produce on that registry are testimony to your hard work. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.